What's up guys, it's Dollmatter Matter here, and today we're gonna to be reacting to a new channel. So this is Robert Sepper. Uh, I'm probably mispronouncing that last name. Uh, but anyway, the video is Meaning of the Double-Headed Eagle. So yeah, we talked about this uh, in, I can't remember which video it was. It might have been one about the Hittites uh, and how all these Indo-European people have the double-headed eagle. Um, and then I think somebody suggested this video after that. But anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. Swan. Do y'all want the bread? Honor a duck. I think that's a duck. Yeah, definitely not a swan. It's a weird looking duck. I have to be careful because that big white goose is swimming there in the background and oh it's a goose okay okay i don't think i've ever seen a goose other than a canadian goose and it turns out that he's not a fan of anthropology you might recognize him from some of my past videos that's a swan he thing. never oh, seems no, that hungry is a goose. that's the goose and tends to scream and shout at me when i try to feed him so i'll try to keep out of his way from now on <laughs> I they all just show up the second somebody's got food. He's fucking with the other birds. He's a dick. I ended up naming that white goose after a bird deity famous in India called Ganda Barunda, which was the symbol used by several rulers to represent their ancient kingdoms. The Ganda Barunda is a two-headed bird in Hindu mythology, believed to possess immense magical strength and worshipped as an avatar of Lord Vishnu. It's often depicted as clutching elephants in its talons Oh, and sometimes cool. holding a snake in its beak with long tail feathers like a peacock. Of course, it is most often compared to another similar symbol, that of the two-headed eagle. In heraldry, the two-headed eagle is associated with the concept of empire, and this can be said for any number of famous empires, from the Byzantine to those of ancient Mesopotamia, the symbol was always associated with power and dominion. That said, in today's episode, I'd like to explore its deeper occult significance and in an attempt to explain how it came to be and its esoteric significance to royal families and nobility throughout the ages. First, let's take a look at some examples to get familiar with the symbol and see if we can notice any patterns. The double-headed eagle is used as an emblem by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for about 250 years, formally adopted from the personal emblem of King Frederick the Great of Prussia, who in 1786 became the first sovereign grand commander of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree. Albania, Serbia, Montenegro, and Russia have a double-headed eagle in their coat of arms. 
The double-headed eagle is now used as an emblem by any number of Orthodox Christian churches, including the Greek Orthodox Church and the Orthodox Church of Albania. In modern Greece, it appears in official use in the coat of arms of the Hellenic army. A soldier's sentence over double-headed eagle symbol? Making the symbol of the double-headed eagle of their hands sentenced to 60 days in... Why, are they, why were they sentenced for it? The two-headed eagle also appears on the modern and historical arms and flags of Austria-Hungary, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, Armenia, Montenegro, and Serbia. It's also used in the municipal arms of a number of cities in Germany, Germany yet. Yeah, there we Netherlands, go. Spain, Italy. As I was say, Germany's probably, like, as a Westerner, the, the first one you think of when you think of the double-headed eagle is Germany. I'm surprised that wasn't, like, the first one like he mentioned. Maybe it's just because it was so obvious. And Croatia. The design was introduced in a number of British municipal coats of arms and is also found in a number of British family coats of arms. It's also widely used in modern Turkey. Most historians will trace these symbols back to the Holy Roman Empire, which they claim is just an extension of the single-headed imperial eagle used centuries earlier. Yeah, the thing is, that's obviously not true because, you know, for example, we have Hittites. There's, like, the Hittites were using it, and, um, fuck, when was that, like, 2000 BC, I want to say? I'm probably, I'm, I'm off there, but, like, yeah. It's been around for thousands of years. Which is an oversimplification and misses its occult significance, which was resurrected during the Renaissance. A distinguishing feature of the Holy Roman Eagle was that it was often depicted with halos. After the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire in 1806, the double-headed eagle was retained by the Austrian Empire and served also as a coat of arms of the German Confederation. The double-headed eagle was a main element of the coat of arms of the Russian Empire for several centuries until 1917 and the Bolshevik Revolution. I'll add a link in the description to a video I did on the subject. It's an important presentation, and I suggest watching it. The woke Bolshevik Revolution. It was restored in 1993 and remains in use in Russia up until present, although the eagle on the current coat of arms is golden rather than the traditional imperial black. The double-headed eagle motif was also adopted in the Muslim world, notably on coins and some stone reliefs on the towers of Turkish fortresses. It can also be found in Egypt. The Turks is interesting. So is that something that predates, is that from Indo-European influence or is it something that predates the Indo-Europeans? Because you, you see that with some stuff like the swastika, for example. There's Native American tribes that have it, which means that, you know, the, the last common ancestor of U Europeans, Eurasians, and Native Americans must have been using the swastika for it to be showing up both among the Indo-Europeans and Native American groups. I wonder if it's something similar with that with the Turks, or do they pick it up along the way from... Because they were obviously interacting with like, the Scythians and the Tokarians and the I Iranians and stuff like that. I wonder if um, the Greeks eventually they conquered. On a stone relief on the walls of the Cairo Citadel, the early Byzantine Empire used the single-headed imperial eagle motif as the double-headed eagle appears only in the medieval period by about the 10th century in Byzantine art, during an influx of Aryan migration into Europe, which brought certain esoteric ideas with them, even though the symbol was used in Anatolia and Eurasia for many millennia before that. After the Bronze Age collapse, there's a gap for more than two millennia before the reappearance of the double-headed eagle. Use of the double-headed eagle in the Hittite imagery has been interpreted as a royal insignia. The Hittites were among the first populations to break off from the original demographic of Proto-Indo-Europeans, or Aryans, as is indicated by their now extinct language. The double-headed eagle, like the swastika, can be found all over the world, including the Americas, and civilizations of the new world. Okay, so interesting. So it is, 
See, that I did not know. So that is very similar to the swastika, where you see Native Americans having the swastika as well. Which means this also must date back to the the split between the groups that would become the Native Americans and the, the Eurasians. Along with the swastika. Here, we see examples of pre-Columbian two-headed eagles with the one in the center attributed to the Olmec period. Despite popular belief, the Olmec were not a single civilization or one race, but speaks to a time period comprising multiple races and cultures. There were black people in the Americas prior to the slave trade, there were East Asian phenotypes, and there were Caucasians, especially bearded ones. There's ample evidence for transatlantic contact during the entire Holocene, genetically as well as archaeologically. Okay, so the, so right off the bat, the 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 Africans there is no genetic evidence of that there is genetic evidence of Australasians, which I you know phenotypically they're, they're you know very similar looking. Um, it, based on the best genetic evidence that we have now. The Australasians were first, or Australasian-related group was first, was then taken over by a later migrating group um, that had, uh, you know, that was related to Europeans, right? This is the, the story that had split from what would become Europeans, I should say. Um, and this is the one that would go on to dominate. And then there was, you know, minor admixture from Polynesians and from Siberia and stuff like that later on. Um, but what is interesting is the... Ancestral North Eurasians, which are a group uh, from that ended up being one of the largest contributors to Indo-European Yamnaya DNA and the first instance of blondism, the highest rate of DNA from that group found outside of uh, outside outside of Indo-European people is among Peruvian natives who also have mummies with red and blonde hair. Uh, so it seems like it's not so much Caucasian, it's not like Caucasians, like, you know, white people going over there. It's basically the these two groups split, and then you have selection pressure both in Northern Europe, which causes this high instance of blondism, uh, and then you have another selection pressure happening in Peru, modern-day Peru, that causes high instance of, of blondism and stuff like that, right? So it's it's they have a common origin, but it's not like white people like we would think of, you know, it's, it's like a cousin population. It's not actually like Europeans going over there. Of course, much of the Mesoamerican double headed eagle symbology came following the Spanish conquest as the Aztec eagle was supplanted by the double headed imperial eagle of the Habsburgs, the insignia of the ruling dynasty in Spain with an overt attempt to also replace a considerable amount of double-headed serpent symbolism in the New World, which brings us to the esoteric meaning, which is also encoded in symbols from Mesopotamia and Egypt, where a winged disc will have two serpents dangling from the bottom. These two serpents share the same significance as the double serpent tail of Melusine, a figure of European folklore, which I've covered in a prior video, that's also sometimes illustrated with wings, along with two tails, or both. The same symbolism can be seen yes, in the serpent goddess of the Minoan civilization, which is always depicted holding two snakes. I'll include a link in the description for those interested, as I don't want to be redundant. We also find similar symbology with the pre-Roman Mediterranean deity called Vanth, who is depicted with two serpents entwined around the arms, also closely associated with the Etruscan goddess of the underworld, Vatica, which is where the Vatican gets its name from, oh, interesting. with one of its meanings of it. being divine serpent. Of course, the Caduceus is the staff carried by Hermes in Greek mythology, and consequently by Hermes Trismegistus in Greco-Egyptian mythology. It's a short staff entwined by two serpents, usually surmounted by wings. To take it a step further, 
the two-headed eagle, the double-tailed melusine, and the two serpents of the winged disc all share esoteric origins with the two-pillar symbolism in art and architecture, whether it be the two towers which comprise many cathedrals built by the Templars, or the two pillars at the front of any Masonic lodge. One pillar would often be constructed with brass or bronze, which are considered sun metals, and the other with tin or zinc, which is a moon metal. This mixture of sun oh, and moon no in an alchemical context represents male and female energetic polarity, which is the basis for transmutation of prana, chi, or vril. In regards to the two-headed eagle, phoenix, or serpent, these are all affiliated with the solar mysteries and represent both the sun and the planet or god closely associated with the sun, which is of course Jupiter. The same way that Vishnu, the deity linked to the Ganda Barunda bird, is linked to Jupiter, so is Marduk, Aura, Mazda, and Zeus, as Jupiter traverses the sun's ecliptic over its roughly 12-year orbit, passing through the 12 houses of the zodiac. In addition to Jupiter's 12-year orbit and the 12 months in one orbit of the Earth around the sun, there's a 26,000-year cycle that is also divided into 12, known as the precession of the equinox. This cyclical progression through the stars is recorded in many ways through numerous civilizations from the epic of Gil. I always find it fascinating how people were able to figure out the star stuff like way back in the day. I mean, I guess you didn't have much else to do at night, right? Like you're not going to be sitting up or reading or fucking watching Netflix or something. Um, but just how much they were able to figure out and just do the math on, you know, and, and like, oh yeah, this will take 26,000 years to come back around. It's like, bro, how much are you staring at the fucking sky that you realize that? Gamesh recorded on 12 tablets to the 12 labors of Hercules, which describes his journey through the 12 signs of the Zodiac, to the pre-Christian Mithraic mysteries of the ancient Aryans of Iran, where the solar deity Mithras is often depicted killing a bull ending the astrological age of Taurus around 2000 BC, ushering in the age of Aries. As far as Judaism is concerned, this transition is told in the story of Moses, where he comes down from Mount Sinai after speaking to God to find his people worshiping a golden calf. Gold is the metal associated with the sun, and the calf represented Taurus, which Moses destroys, making way for the new age of the ram. The age of Aries ended around the time of Jesus, which represents the age of Pisces, and the fish symbology we find interwoven into the New Testament. This should not in any way discount the spiritual message revered by Christians, but all Abrahamic faiths are part of the solar mysteries, which did not start with Jews, but stretches back into the Pleistocene. In order for people to document a cyclical pattern in the sky that takes 25,920 years to complete, it means that people must have been documenting the changes in the heavens for at least that long. Impl Not necessarily. I mean, if you see something's moving at a, ra at a certain rate, you're going to know how long it's going to take it. I guess it, it depends on how much information you have, right? Um, but yeah, if you, if you, <clears throat> you see something moving at a certain rate, you're going to know how long it's going to take to get back to that position, right? You <clears throat> so, yeah, you, you just need to watch it long enough to see its rate of movement. Applying that and have something else to compare theology to. likely originated during the time period the Greeks and Egyptians attributed to Atlantis. <laughs> I was not expecting that Atlantis turn at the end. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. I, I didn't realize the etymological origin of the Vatican, or um, 
I, I knew a lot of the stuff about like the the old like Roman mysteries and obviously uh, you know the different ages and stuff. So much of that is that that is like well documented and well known. The stuff about like Africans being in in the Americas was kind of odd because they they weren't. There's no genetic evidence for that, despite what he says. The only uh, transatlantic ple- uh, transoceanic pre-Columbian DNA that we have is uh small amounts of um what am I th- uh Polynesian uh from recent uh, admixture like a couple hundred years before the uh, Colombian exchange uh and then small amounts of Australasian from prior to the initial wave which seems to be a wave that was, you know, the the I shouldn't say initial wave because obviously they would have been the initial wave, um, but yeah, there's no there's no evidence of like this is like a common like black conspiracy like black nationalist conspiracy theory that you hear a lot, but you know maybe there will be evidence eventually. I'm not, I'm not counting it out, but as of right now, there is none. Um, and also, yeah, the, the white people, um, y- yes and no. I mean, phenotypically, well, it's hard to say. Uh, you know how much their face would look like, but their uh, the hair, yes. But th- again, that's from a common ancestral trait that c- has a selection pressure happening after. And, and in the case of the Europeans, right? It's like the Europeans weren't even white at the time. We had the selection pressure later, as well as them, right? So it's like common origin that similar, well, possibly similar selection pressure. There was selection pressure in both areas, led to a, a common outcome, but. Um, Anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.